the lecture today covers space groups, uh, which is a development from the 32 point groups where we also include certain elements of translational symmetry. So combining the point groups and the Bravi lattices gives us a much larger number of uh, space groups. In the last lecture, we discussed uh, lead titanate and we began with an accumulation of experimental data where we know the chemical formula, we know the lattice type using X-ray diffraction, we know the cell volume and the density and therefore we can show that there is just one formula unit in the cell which is therefore primitive and we have information about valencies which indicates that the coordination of oxygen around titanium will be larger than around lead. And furthermore, that the crystal doesn't have a center of symmetry because it's uh, piezoelectric. <clears throat> so we take all this information and we assume a trial point group, in this case 4mm, and see whether this group satisfies all of the experimental data. Uh, in particular, the fact that we have three oxygen atoms, one titanium atom and one lead atom. So in this lattice, if we place uh, an oxygen atom at a point symmetry 2 mm, then we will obtain two atoms according to the Wy Wyckoff table within the unit cell. The third oxygen atom at this phase center where the point symmetry is 4 mm, uh, we will have just one of those and therefore we get the correct number of oxygen atoms. Similarly, uh, the titanium, which has a greater coordination of oxygen atoms around it, we would place uh, here, where also the point symmetry, side symmetry is uh, 4 mm, and therefore we have just one titanium atom, and similarly for the lead atoms, where the point symmetry is 4 mm. So we convinced ourselves that this is the right structure for titanium and you can use uh, more detailed x-ray diffraction which also analyzes um, intensities to show that indeed these are the atomic positions of the, of the various species. Now this particular structure does not involve translational elements of symmetry uh, such as uh, improper rotations and glide planes. So we are going to deal with that today. So just to uh, remind you, we have uh, rotation axes and we have inversion axes in the point symmetry elements. But in addition, it's possible to have screw axes. So for example, uh, this notation here means that I rotate by 90 degrees and then translate by a quarter of the repeat distance along the screw axis. And these are notations for glide planes and I'll explain them later. A glide plane means that you reflect about that plane and then you translate parallel to the plane. So this is a, a 2-1 screw axis. This is a, a dyad and you rotate by 180 degrees, you recover uh, the structure over there, and T is the repeat distance. A screw diode would involve a rotation of 180 degrees and a translation parallel to the screw axis of half the repeat distance. Uh, we can have uh, these varieties of screw axes, um, hexads and tetrads and triads as well. And just to illustrate to you the four, uh, the fourfold rotation axis, here, if I rotate by 90 degrees, I recover the structure, and this is the distance between the repeat units along the axis. In this case, I rotate by 90 degrees and then translate by a quarter to recover the structure. Here, we rotate by 90 degrees and translate by half the repeat distance. And in this case, we rotate uh, 90 degrees and translate by three quarters of the repeat distance. So screw axes involve rotation combined with a translation along the screw axis. 
this is uh, in contrast to glide planes where we reflect and then we translate parallel to the glide plane but of course a plane is a plane so we can translate we have uh, we can translate along two orthogonal directions for example now when the translation is along uh, one of the edges of the cell and by half the repeat distance we call that the a b or c glide plane axial glide uh, meaning that you know we are reflecting across the plane and then translating half the repeat distance along that particular direction a diagonal glide uh, you know is self-explanatory that we use a combination of two translations uh, here we have a and c half the repeat distance and similarly these two and these are called the n glide planes it's possible to have diamond glide and in fcc that would be a quarter of a translate a, a distance corresponding to a quarter of the repeat distance when you combine two direct uh, two uh, translations like a plus c or b plus c and a plus b and in the diamond glide in body centered cubic where that might happen on a one 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 plane for example uh, it's a quarter of a combination of all three a plus b plus c so this is axial glide this is diagonal glide for obvious reasons and this is called n glide this is diamond glide and this involves translation this way this way and then out of the plane of the board uh, is also a diamond glide plane Okay, so here is the crystal structure on the left of diamond, uh, where we have carbon atoms, uh, a pair of carbon atoms uh, at zero, 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 and a quarter, 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 located at every single lattice point of the cubic F uh, lattice. Now, you can see here that we have a diamond glide plane, because if I take this atom here, reflect it to this position and translate it by a quarter and then a quarter downwards then i recover the atom at three quarters okay so take this one reflect uh, and then translate so there's an atom at zero translate upwards to get this atom at a quarter so this is called a diamond glide plane uh, in, in a point group uh, where we are looking, uh, for example, at macroscopic symmetry, you would not see such small translations and therefore the glide plane would appear like a mirror plane. Now, there is no glide plane here because these two atoms are different. They're not identical species, okay? This slide shows uh, pyrite which is an iron sulfide and we discussed it briefly in the previous lecture there are these beautiful cuboidal crystals of pyrite which immediately tells us that it belongs to the cubic crystal class because it has the defining symmetry of four triads uh, the body diagonals uh, going through the cubes the structure illustrated on the left is too complicated to see in three dimensions so what we'll do is we'll draw a projection as usual and here is the projection with the gray atoms being the iron atoms and the blue atoms the sulfur atoms now there are translational elements of symmetry uh, for example this is a screw dyad that means if i rotate by 180 degrees I get another atom at 0.39, but then if I translate half a repeat distance along the screw axis, I recover the position at 0.89, uh, the sulfur atom at 0.89 height. And of course, this screw will operate in the same way with all the, all the atoms. So this is an iron atom at 0, 0, 0, rotate by 180 degrees and translate by half of the repeat distance normal to the diagram. So these are screw axes, which when looking at the macroscopic symmetry, 
would appear like a dyad because you do not pick up these very small translations on a macroscopic scale. Similarly, uh, these are glide planes uh, which involve a reflection and translation. So for example, if I take this uh, sulfur atom at 0.61, reflect it across here, there's nothing, but then I translate parallel to that plane uh, by half the repeat distance and I recover the atom, sulfur atom over here. And that uh, would apply to any, any of these atoms here and even the iron atoms. So this involves one single translation parallel to the uh, plane. Uh, so we would call this an A-glide plane, okay? Uh, A-glide plane because it's normal to the x-axis. So there are only really two symmetry elements in this crystal structure uh, needed in order to describe the uh, so um, there are symmetry elements other than these translational symmetry elements. For example, there is a center of symmetry at half, half, half. And of course, uh, that because we have that center of symmetry, that makes uh, the triads inversion triads, as we discussed in a previous lecture. Three becomes three bar if you have a center of symmetry. So we write the space group as P for primitive, A glide, and bar three. And if we were looking at the point group of this by looking at the cuboidal shape, then we would write it as P M bar three. So that is the space group, which if you look at the Wyckoff tables, we'll describe uh, completely where the atoms should be located, depending on the point symmetry at each location. <clears throat> so we consider next uh, the symmetry of the cementite crystal structure. Uh, cementite has the chemical formula Fe3C and it has an orthorhombic unit cell. So all three edges are of different lengths and all the angles between the unit cell edges are 90 degrees. This is the three-dimensional structure showing 12 iron atoms and four carbon atoms in the unit cell. Now, as usual, this is too complicated to look at, so we'll draw a projection, um, projection of the structure as usual. And this is much easier to visualize. And when you think about this, you see that this is a primitive cell. In other words, uh, there are 12 plus four, 16 atoms that you place at the, uh, associate with each lattice point in the cell. So we're going to look next at the crystal structure of cementite. Cementite is an iron carbide with the chemical formula roughly Fe3C and it has an orthorhombic lattice which means that all the lattice parameters are of different length uh, and all the angles between the unit cell edges are 90 degrees. Now, as you can see, there are 12 iron atoms inside the unit cell and four carbon atoms uh, all within the unit cell. So 16 atoms in total. Now, obviously this is a bit more complicated to look at, so we will draw a projection as usual. And here is the projection. And if you look at this carefully, uh, there is no single atom which has uh, the same environment as another. So this is a primitive crystal structure with a motif of 16 atoms per, uh, per lattice point. So primitive orthorhombic lattice 
with a motif of 16 atoms per lattice point. Now we're going to uh, build up the space group of the structure and just to remind you of the convention, uh, you know, we will start with the symmetry element associated with X, Y and Z to build up the symbol that goes after P to create the space group. Okay, so the first thing we notice is that there is an N glide plane um, here which is normal to the x-axis. So if I take this atom um, at a third and I reflect it, then I translate by a half and a half upwards, then I recover the atom at five-sixths. So that is an and glide which involves two translations, first going from here to here and then half outside of the plane of the board. And similarly, you know, if I take this carbon atom and I reflect it here, translate by a half parallel to the glide plane and then half upwards parallel to the glide plane, I recover the carbon atom at, um, at this location. So these are the N glide planes, which involve two translations parallel to the glide plane. So, so far our space group symbol becomes P N, primitive lattice and an N glide plane normal to the X axis. In addition, we have mirror planes. So obviously uh, you can see that these directly reflect. So these are mirror planes and the thing to notice here, and which has certain effects on the properties, is that four of the ion atoms are located on the mirror planes, but the other ion atoms are not located on the mirror planes. And similarly, if you look at the carbon atoms, they are all located on the mirror planes. So having discovered these mirror planes, uh, we expand our space group notation to P and M. Okay, and these mirror planes are normal to the y-axis. I'm now going to turn the cell around so that we're looking at the x and z axes on the diagram. So here is uh, a different projection and you can see that we have these A glide planes. That means that if I reflect this atom to this position and then translate it half parallel to that plane, then I recover the atom. So now our space group symbol becomes PNMA. Okay. So let's have a uh, look at the location of atoms uh, with respect to the point symmetries where they are located. So uh, first of all, the ion atoms, we have only the mirror plane passing through these four ion atoms. So if you look at the Wyckoff table, uh, where the point side symmetry is a mirror plane, we expect four atoms, and indeed we have four atoms at those coordinates. For the other atoms, there are no symmetry elements passing through them, uh, just a monad, and therefore we expect eight of them, and indeed we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight ion atoms. Now the carbon atoms have the same point symmetry as these ion atoms, in other words a mirror plane, and therefore we expect four of these atoms in the unit cell, completely consistent uh, with the space group PNMA. Now this is an orthorhombic unit cell and therefore it's extremely anisotropic. So the elastic modulus varies extremely strongly with the uh, crystallographic orientation. Uh, this is close to zero, okay, not zero, but close to zero. And uh, the, the elastic constant C44 is particularly small in cementite. And sometimes, you know, when we do first principles calculations and we do them a little bit sloppily, we get a negative value for C44, which doesn't make sense because the lattice would be mechanically unstable. 
So, but if you do them rigorously, you get a finite value for C44. So you might wonder, you know, if shear is so easy, then why is cementite hard? And there's a really interesting reason that when you elastically strain the cementite, uh, you know, because it's an anisotropic structure, the point group symmetry, uh, the space group symmetry changes to monoclinic P21 over C. And from the point of view of bonding, that strengthens the covalent component of bonding and therefore the crystal actually becomes stiffer. Okay? So that's the elastic modulus of cementite. Now, so far we've talked about uh, the symmetries of individual crystals, but very often we get a precipitate forming in a matrix. Okay? So, Obviously, the precipitate will try in some way or another to precipitate in an orientation which gives reasonable matching with the matrix. So here is an example of an orthorhombic silver-rich precipitate, omega, that forms inside aluminum, which is a face-centered cubic. And it precipitates in this particular orientation relationship that the O01 direction of the orthorhombic structure is parallel to the close back direction of the aluminium. And the 100 direction of the omega is parallel to the 10 bar 1 of aluminium. Now, uh, this is an orthorhombic structure, so this is a diet, and so is this. This is a diet, and this is a triad. Now, if you look at this orientation relationship, the two crystals are sharing certain symmetry elements as best as they can. So for example, this dyad is parallel to this tetrad, and this dyad is parallel to this tetrad, and this one to this, and so on. Now, it's easier to see this if we, uh, take an electron diffraction pattern, which includes both phases. So here is the electron diffraction pattern from the omega, and this is from the aluminum. And you can see that the, there is a, a diad going this way, and there's a mirror plane here. And similarly, there's a diad going this way, and a mirror plane this way. And indeed, when you look at the shape of the precipitate, it also has the shape 2 upon m. So, to some extent, they are sharing common symmetry elements when a precipitate forms in a matrix. Now, in this analysis, we are, to a large extent, ignoring the mechanism by which the precipitate forms. For example, if it forms by displacive transformation, then you expect that the shape and orientation will be governed by other factors, uh, such as uh, the large strain energy component. So we have now completed uh, a discussion of the symmetry of crystals, and we are going to move on to other topics in the next lecture. So that's all there is today. Thank you.